On hand is our old friend, the musical director of The Voice of America, Walter Duclou. Next to him is John Gutman, one of Rudolf Bing's able associates here at the Metropolitan. This is Mr. Mr. Gutman's uh, second visit to our quiz. And third, last, and definitely not least, is the distinguished music critic of the Saturday Review of Literature, Irving Collodin. Welcome, gentlemen, and here comes today's parade of questions. Here's number one. Mrs. Gerald Eisner of Mount Vernon, New York, would like our quiz experts to account for the possession of the ring from the time it is taken from the Rhine maidens in Das Rheingold until it is returned to them at the end of Goethe Demerol. Now, suppose we take this step by step, and I'll start off. Alberich steals it from the Rhine maidens in Rheingold. Now, what happens next, I'm Mr. Mr. Collot? Hmm? He just steals the gold, does he not? And makes the ring out of the gold. Now, that's a very uh, inconvenient remark, Mr. Cologne. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Duclos. I'm afraid that Mr. Cologne is a little off, too, because Mimi makes the ring. Well, but I mean, it's, it's uh, not. He doesn't Arbery steal it. it. Arbery steals the gold and Mimi turns it into a ring. Yeah. All right. We're, we're wrong so far. <laughs> uh, uh, what happens after that? Uh, well, Mr. of course, Votan dispossesses uh, me, uh, Alberich of the ring, mm -hmm. how I never could find out because the man who owns it is supposed to be the most powerful thing there is, and how could there be somebody more powerful? But I'll well, pass on to Mr. Well, Gordon. that's another inconvenient <laughs> question. I <laughs> wish it. Sorry. Now, next. Uh, well, what's the next step, Mr. Well, the next Mr. step Dicou. is that uh, Wotan is, uh, against his will, forced to pay the ring with the rest of the gold to the giants uh, for a friar. Yes, uh, Mr. Gutman. And Gutman's. then no sooner do the giants get it when one kills the other in order to get it from him, isn't that right? Right. Now, in Valkyrie, the ring doesn't change hands. But what's the next step, Mr. Colodin? Well, Fafner, who's taken up residence in a large cave, uh, <laughs> is sleeping with it there and uh, guarding it until he's awakened by Siegfried in the latter part of that opera. And, of course, a fight ensues, and uh, Siegfried... Uh, kills Fafner and uh, takes all his possessions. And what's next, Mr. Duclos? In the first, a in the first oh. act of Cote Demerung, yes. uh, Siegfried leaves the ring with Brunhilde as a uh, token of his love while he's going for new adventures. After uh, that... Now uh, the next step. One more step, uh, another step. He's, uh, he's, he's given the ring to Brunhilde in the first act. Now what happens? Yes, uh, Siegfried returns in the guise of Konter uh, transformed by the Tarnhelm and uh, wrests the ring from Brunhilde again in the guise of Contra. Right. Brings it back to Gibich's Hall, where it is recognized as being on Siegfried's finger by Brunhilde, yeah. who thus discovers that the man who has actually won her it was not Contra but Siegfried, who has uh, uh, committed treason in this respect. Yes, and she's a very puzzled girl. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Collodin, what, well, what's the next after, uh, when Siegfried is finally killed and his body is brought back to the same hall, uh, Hagen attempts to uh, get it out of this, uh, Siegfried's hand, and there's the uh, startling moment when the dead finger rises and Hagen falls yes. back away from it. And what happens then with the ring, Mr. Duclos? Brunhilde takes it off Siegfried's hands right. again and uh, 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 keeps it on her hand when she rushes into the fire on her horse. Thus returning it to the Rhine Maidens, yes. Hagen, in the attempt to recover it from the Rhine Maidens, drowns in the Rhine, and the Rhine Maidens get it back. Get it back and, uh, wait, it for, and wait for next season to start it all over again. Now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's the next question. Russell L. Test, a very appropriate name, of Evanston, Illinois, wants to know if there are any characters appearing in all four operas of the ring. Mr. Gutman. Well, I would say physically, no. I mean, I don't think that any person in the ring that appears in Rheingold <coughs> appears all over the place, or am I wrong? Well, Mr. Uh, Culloden thinks you are, I think. Only the conductor. I mean, he, he's there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and some of the stagehands, Mr. Oh, well, Vo Votan is in the ring. He is seen at the oh, end. Yes. At the burning of Valhalla. He's sitting up there, well, waiting no. to get burned. <laughs> right, Mr. But he, doesn't, he, doesn't he doesn't draw say. a fee that evening, Mr. <laughs> Taylor. He isn't paid for that? No, he isn't paid for that. At least not as far as I know. I hope not. We'll take that up with equity. <laughs> <laughs> no, but isn't, seriously speaking, isn't Loge, although he appears only physically, only once, isn't he present since he is fire? Isn't he present in Valkyra, where 
uh, Wotan puts the curtain of fire around mm -hmm. uh, Brynhilde and then in the same scene in Siegfried, I mean when Siegfried comes to see Brynhilde and again in the burning scene at the last act of Göttingen. Yes, so well, Loge in some shape or other, mostly not human or mm -hmm. most bodily, is present in all four. Yes, but he isn't an actor in two of them. No. He's impersonated by the stagehands. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'd, be inclined, I'd, I'd be inclined to, to say that, strictly speaking, he does not. But if you want to make it you know, symbolically in the form of fire, yes, he does. Now, here's an interesting question from uh, Clyde Bovell of New York City. Mr. Bovell wonders whether the quiz experts agree with his contention that something should be done about the overlong Wagnerian operas with their at least hour-long acts and sometimes more. Wouldn't it be better, suggests Mr. Bovell, to hear the operas as they are done in the famous Bayreuth tradition, at which city the uh, Ring and other Wagnerian operas are regularly presented starting at 4 p.m. or thereabouts, with a break for dinner about halfway through the opera. Mr. Bobel feels that this gives the hearer a real chance to hear the opera completely refreshed. This, he writes, provides the only ideal conditions under which full-length Wagnerian operas should be presented. He's very positive about it. What do you think, gentlemen, Mr. Colosso? Well, I think you have to uh, differentiate between festival performances and performances in ordinary repertory theater. That uh, Wagner himself, I don't think, uh, imagined that, that his works would uh, become as much a part of the repertory as the uh, ordinary operas of his day that he was trying to surpass. Yeah, I think that's true. Mr. Gutman. I think it is quite true that in terms of uh, Wagner's own uh, wishes, uh, Mr. Bovell is quite right because after all that is why Wagner, as we all know, built the theater in Bayreuth. For a long time, he wouldn't have possible performed anywhere else. But um, uh, I suggest, I would like to ask, what would it mean in terms of the Metropolitan Opera, for instance? I suggest to Mr. Bovell that once in a while, when uh, a very lengthy Wagner opera starts as late as 8 o'clock, if you would like to be here for the first curtain and to see, even in a sold-out house, how few people are in their seats at 8 o'clock, and I'll leave it to him how many people would be in their seats at 4 p.m. Well, you know, in my time, I have seen uh, performances of Parsifal at this opera house starting at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Run an hour and a half, then knock off for dinner and resume at 8. And I must say, it's a less exhausting experience. Mr. Collodin. Well, I was only going to observe, as you, uh, <coughs> well, would say yourself, that uh, that was at a period when Parsifal was something of a ritual, and... Uh, people were uh, becoming acquainted with it. Yes, that's true. Basic tradition. Uh, well, now Mrs. Uh, Joseph L. Pace of San Jose, California, is interested in the striking stage effects that are so distinctly a feature of Wagner's music dramas. And she suggests that we describe for her how some of the magic uh, stage effects are carried out. Uh, I'll give you the examples, and you gentlemen see if you can uh, enlighten Mrs. Pace. The flowing of the River Rhine in Das Rheingold. Mr. Uh, that is usually done by uh, lighting effects upon a gauze curtain that is hung in front of the stage and on which uh, a projector, a projector uh, projects uh, green effects of uh, flowing water. I think, by the way, Mr. Gutman ought to be barred from this uh, particular question <laughs> because as a member of the staff of the Metropolitan, <laughs> he, he probably produces most of those effects. So, <laughs> I'm uh, willing to be excluded, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> The magic fire in Valkyra. Mr. Culloden? Well, I've always understood it was, uh, as well as lighting in the background to uh, depict the flickering, uh, there's a certain amount of silk uh, ribbon, so to speak, that is blown upward by use of fans, steam, which fills As a matter of fact, I was for... once uh, privileged to go backstage and visit the what they call the Valhalla Fire Department. And the, uh, the, the, it's very ingenious. There's a long trough or box and uh, as you say, on, its, uh, on, the, on the rim are nailed uh, strips of red chiffon. Uh, then below that are red bulbs, and under, the, and under those, an electric fan. So the fan goes and the chiffon blows around, and then they throw Christmas tree snow into it to make sparks. Yes, sir. Mr. Gutman. Say, this is the most interesting revelation I've had since I work at the Metropolitan Opera, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, changes of scenery doing Rheingold, where the uh, mountain uh, sinks down into Nibelheim. Mr. Duclos. Well, this, of course, uh, I, I don't know, does the question refer specifically to the Metropolitan or to any opera house? Well, I, I suppose it, she means the Metropolitan. 
That I couldn't tell you, Mr. Gutman. I think it's it It just gets well, dark. I, no, I think it's, it's, it's to reverse. Instead of going down, it goes up. Oh. Pardon me for waving, but uh, <laughs> you know, what I mean is the, uh, the, the set on the stage uh, is uh, drawn upward, and it gives the illusion of yes, the exactly. descent. I know William Henderson, the great music critic of the New York Sun, told me that during the regime of Maurice Grau, he was sitting at a dress rehearsal of Rheingold, which Grau had given an entirely new production. And uh, as the thing began to sink or rise, whichever you please, he complimented Grau on this particular set, on his realism. And Grau said, yeah, look here. He had the score in his hand. He says here, alles versinkt. And it cost me $40,000. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in some operas, there are parts that are sung but have no words. Uh, our Fred Gilbert of College Station, Texas, would like you to mention at least four of these wordless tunes, including two from Wagner's Ring, and to identify the characters who sing them and the situation. Okay, Mr. Duclos. Well, I think the first instance would be the beginning of the Rheingold, where the Rhine daughters sing... Uh, Double Gala, Gala, yeah, all these Ws. Uh, Lines. Mr. Gutman. Well, and hoya to ho also, I believe, means nothing in anybody's language. It's not much of a lyric, I must say. <laughs> well, go, well to, to get away from Wagner for a minute. Uh, Is it Mr. limited to opera? Yes, it's limited to opera. To Mr. Mr. Culloden. I was trying to think of the various people who sing shepherd roles. Do they, do they have words for oh, those Oh, yes, Frau Holder or whatever her name Tosca? is. Tosca? Yeah, there are words to that. Well, uh, Rigoletto sings a wordless tune just before Vilbrazza Donata. Uh, Mr. Well, Taylor. I was thinking of, for instance, the uh, Siemens chorus in The Flying Dutchman. Hoyo ho, hoyo ho, these. That's not ho? exactly. It's, a, it's a, a call, but hardly a lyric. Well, uh, the, the Rhine Maidens you had, and then there's the song that Carmen sings, uh, uh, Don Jose, in the second act. Gentlemen, the next question I don't think we have to take too seriously, but possibly there is a serious implication behind it. It comes from Mrs. Harriet Shields of Oakland, California. She says, if Mrs. A and Mrs. B are equally fond of one of the ring operas, such as the uh, Goethe Demerung, what would happen to their comparative enjoyment if Mrs. A hears it by itself this year and Mrs. B hears it after first hearing the other three operas of the ring? In other words, is it more fun to hear Goethe Demerung by itself or as a finale? Mr. Duclos. I think it's definitely preferable to hear it after having heard the other Wagner operas, uh, the Ring operas, rather, because the uh, uh, three preceding operas get you sort of in the mood. I mean, you learn to know more painlessly than is possible in the Gutter and Maroon the thematic material, the motive, uh, mm. motives and so forth. And I, also must, the I must say you learn to know it all over again as each one goes by. I, I uh, wonder if uh, that Mrs. B has anything to do with a Mr. B that... Uh, is prominent in this organization. I, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I've just had to signal that all is ready backstage for the third act and the famous ride of the Valkyries, and so we must end today's quiz. Thank you, Messrs. Culloden, Gutnam, and Duclou for another enjoyable and provocative session of the Metropolitan Opera Quiz. This is Deems Taylor, hoping that you'll all be with us next week for another meeting of the Opera Quiz. <laughs>